welcome back. With hospitals closing for lack of staff, provinces are calling for more federal dollars for health care. But what is being spent? Here's a look at health care spending by the numbers. Total health spending in Canada was estimated at $308 billion in 2021. That is 12.7% of GDP. It amounts to $8,019 per person. It's also a jump from the 11.6% of GDP in 2019 after pandemic-related health costs drove spending higher. Hospitals account for 25% of health spending, followed by drugs at 14% and doctors at 13%. Other health staff, including nurses, make up 8% of the spending, and a new category of COVID-related spending is the next 7%. COVID is expensive. Health experts report that the average cost of a COVID stay in hospital is three times the cost of a stay for a heart attack. The other big expense for healthcare is old people. In 2021, people aged 65 and up made up 18% of our population, but used 45% of our healthcare dollars. Staffing shortages are being blamed for hospital department closures. The promise to hire more nurses and doctors trained internationally has been offered up as one solution. But are there other long-term problems with attracting and keeping people in these health care jobs? Linda Silas is president of the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions. Linda, thanks for being with us. Good afternoon, Amanda. So we, uh, it feels to me as though the shortage of healthcare professionals predates the pandemic. Uh, it has obviously been made acute and we know there's massive burnout going on. But is this a, a problem that we've had for a while that we still haven't solved? Yes, I was listening to you uh, riled up all the numbers and my head was spinning. And I'm thinking, when are we going to get it right? Because we were talking about a nursing shortage pre-pandemic. We knew the healthcare workforce needed uh, to be fixed. The workloads were too heavy. The vacancies were too high. The overtime and absenteeism was way too high. And everyone was ignoring it. And then the pandemic hit. So, yes, we, we need to work at it. And we have to start with retention. You know, I've been saying we have to stop the bleed. Too many nurses, too many healthcare workers are leaving every day and it's putting pressure, financial pressure, but also human resource pressure on our system. And there is this cap in place on, uh, on wages. Is that a real sticking point? Would it make a difference, do you think, Linda, in terms of keeping people and attracting new people to the jobs if wages could be more flexible? Oh, you know, the, the caps on wages uh, started, those discussions started pre-pandemic. And now they're just a pure insult to nurses and every other worker that have to uh, work within them, negotiate within them, because you will not retain with this hammer over workers' head that we will not negotiate higher wages. Mm -hmm. When you know, if I just look at nurses, uh, nurses are quitting. One in two are telling us they've had enough, they want to leave the system. And then you have agencies charging hospitals and long-term care double, triple the salaries of nurses, and that's where nurses are going. Not for higher salaries, because the private agency is getting that, but for more flexibility and for able to close the door when they leave because they're not attached to that workplace anymore. Do you welcome this idea of foreign trained nurses joining the ranks uh, of nurses here? Is that one solution in the short term to help fill some of these gaps? Yes, for sure. And we've been working at that for many years. The problem is really not the provincial or territorial government or an independent employer or a union. It's the colleges of nurses. Uh, the colleges of nurses now need to find a faster process to uh, review the education and the training of these uh, internationally educated nurses and put them quickly in our system. Hmm. I just look at Nova Scotia. The union changed their collective agreement to fast track the process because as you know, like any job posting process, it's a long process before you actually find a person replaced in that job. The union and the government and employer fast track the process. And we can, that's one example. And with internationally educated nurses, we have examples uh, throughout the country that some colleges are trying and then some employers are trying because they need to be mentored and preceptors. And that's where we can talk about retention of our 
more experienced nurses, they, we need to keep that experience in the system and help these nurses. Linda, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Linda Silas is president of the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions. So it sounds to many as though throwing money at health care would create a better outcome, but wouldn't better use of the money we do spend also make sense? Bob Bell was a deputy minister of health in the province of Ontario and previously president and CEO of the University Health Network, the largest network of hospitals in Canada. Bob, great to have you with us. Hi, Amanda. Nice to be here. So I do want to start with that kind of bigger picture question, which is more money always seems to be the request. Uh, but of course, the, there's this sort of suspicion that we could do better with what we have, the spending we're already doing. How much uh, are we able to think that way and improve the efficiencies of what we're already spending? Yeah, well, you know, listening to Linda, the comments she's making about this being a perfect storm in terms of losing critical players in the health system delivery, like nurses, is certainly true. Uh, you know, Stats Canada suggests that 35,000 vacancies existed in 2021 across the health system. Many of those were in the nursing profession, and we simply have to bring these people back to the, back to the workforce. Um, we have to train more nurses, and we probably have to pay them a bit, bit, bit better in order to uh, you know, convince them that working shift, working in sometimes dangerous situations and epidemics is, is important and is worthwhile work mm -hmm. that uh, we will pay for. There are other things that we can do, though. I mean, the money that we're currently spending, for example, on primary care, we could be introducing more nurse practitioners into primary care. Not every Canadian needs to have a family practitioner. We can be introducing nurse practitioners who are more cost effective into that role. We can look at the way we provide surgery in Canada. We've uh, fallen behind the United States, certainly, in offering ambulatory surgery facilities that have been demonstrated to provide 30% more surgery for about the same cost, the same number of hours of care. So there certainly are things that we can do that are more effective with our current expenditure. Yeah. But with an aging work, with an aging population, and with the need to commit people to come and work in healthcare, we're probably going to have to spend a bit more in some areas as well. As somebody who ran hospitals, Bob, uh, what do, what do you think when you see a hospital closing its ER for hours or days at a time? That's obviously a drastic step. Uh, the worst case scenario, one imagines. Where, what's the path forward when hospitals find themselves in that position? Well, it all depends on their ability to attract people to come and work in the high stress areas, areas like emergency departments, areas like ICUs. And these are these are tough jobs, Amanda, you know, uh, especially if you're short staffed on a chronic basis, people simply get burned out in these roles. And we've got to think through, do we need different approaches? Do we need to pay people differently who are going to work in these higher stressed areas? Uh, how do we encourage people to take on these jobs that currently are difficult to fill and that are resulting in closures of crucial services? Yeah. We, I mean, we know obviously filling the gaps is going to be part of the equation. All of that takes time. Even if it's weeks, it's time we don't really have if hospitals are closing, Bob. Uh, to use a medical term, what's the triage solution? What do we do in the short term to make sure that ERs stay open? Yeah, well, you know, it's possible that we won't be able to keep all the ERs open and we need a backup plan. If somebody's local emergency department is closed, they need to understand where the backup for that care is. Uh, hospitals simply can't keep services open if they don't have the staff. And as you say, Amanda, even if we turn to solutions like internationally trained nursing uh, graduates, that's going to take two to three years to bring these people on board. There are 14,000 internationally educated nurses in Ontario, and those 14,000 aren't going to show up at hospitals any day soon. So we have to think about backup plans. We have to think about contingency plans. If, as we expect, will continue to happen, some emergency departments aren't open, especially over the summer season where, let's face it, nurses like anybody else want to make sure they get time away with their families. Mm -hmm. Bob, so good to have you with us. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Amanda. Bob Bell, a former Deputy Minister of Health in the province of Ontario, previously President and CEO of the University Health Network.
Coming up, Canadians are nervous about their finances and yet maybe not nervous enough. We'll explain. But first, this. The Walt Disney Company is raising its prices. It said this week it will up the rate it charges for its streaming service, Disney Plus, in the U.S. by 38%. But it turns out Disney is no stranger to price inflation. In fact, a chart that went viral this week shows prices at its theme parks have grown close to 4,000% over the past 50 years, eclipsing the inflation rate in, well, everything. And after shuttering the parks briefly in the pandemic, Disney boosted the ticket prices once they reopened. Turns out the happiest place on earth is also the priciest one. We're back after this.